Welcome to you this morning as you join us for Christchurch Dartford Sunday morning worship for Sunday the 15th of November. A warm welcome whether you are here for the first time, whether you have joined us regularly, it's an absolute joy and I pray that you would know the presence of God with you wherever you are this morning. Um, Not a huge amount of notices for you before we move into worship this morning. The one is to say that please do remember that during this second lockdown, um, our services are once again stopped in person, um, but continue online and um, on the telephone. Um, So please do join with those as and when you can. Um, But the church is also open for personal private prayer um, on Wednesdays between 2 and 3. So if that is something that you would find valuable, then please do come along to that. Um, The other thing to say is that we, as everyone else in the nation, um, are keenly aware that Advent and Christmas are fast approaching. And we are thinking really hard about how we can creatively provide spaces for people to celebrate, to remember, um, to feel the emotions of Advent and of Christmas, um, and to worship God in those times. And we're trying to do that um, in as flexible a way as possible, so that whatever the rules happen to be as we approach those seasons, um, and as we're in those seasons, we can adjust whatever we're doing to make sure that as many people as possible can take part in a safer way as possible. Um, so please do keep your eyes peeled. Um, if you're on our mailing list, you should be getting an, an email or a do- letter through your door. Um, if you're not on our mailing list and would like to be, please do email us and Um, We can make sure you're on that. Um, But we'll also be posting anything that we put on Facebook and Twitter as well. So keep an eye on those platforms if you want to. And that is it for the notices today. And so as we come to worship, we pray a prayer of preparation. One that just says to God, our hearts are ready to worship you. We are here and we want to hear from you. And so we pray together wherever we are. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so, as we still our hearts, we will hear Alison reading to us from the Bible as we continue our journey through Luke, um, and then I'll be back to have a think about what those, that passage might mean. Catherine will continue to lead us in sung worship, and Alison will lead us in prayer as well. So thank you to all those people that have been involved in this service. Um, I'm going to hand over to Alison now for the Bible reading. The reading is taken from Luke, chapter 20, verses 1 to 19. One day, as he was teaching the people in the temple courts and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, Why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered, We don't know where it was from. 
Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one they also beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love, perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, may this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief, and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately, because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Alison, for that. So this passage answers some fundamental questions. As Jesus continues to head closer and closer to the cross, as he continues his journey towards where he knows his story will end before he rises again. And in the minds of the people that heard him, there was absolutely no doubt what he was talking about in this passage. But in order for us to understand it, we need to transport our minds a little bit and um, to think a little bit like a first century Jew. So the first thing to note in this story is that the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders all came to him with these questions together. This was an important enough point that these groups, who were all in leadership in the Jewish nation, but who all often had a different focus and had often rivalries between them, they all came to the conclusion that this needed to be addressed and that they should do it together. This Jesus was causing too many issues. This Jesus was causing problems. And they all needed to join together to sort it out and find out exactly what was going on and how they could deal with it. It would be a bit like an issue today that was so important that the Conservatives, the Labour Party, the Green Party and the Brexit Party and various others, I'm not signalling anyone out, um, all decided to work together to sort it out as one mind together moving forward. Seems a little bit unthinkable, right? Apparently a global pandemic can't achieve those conditions. So clearly Jesus was becoming a very big deal that needed addressing. And the other thing to note is that this story continues the narrative that Luke has been telling us, where the ministry of John and the ministry of Jesus are joined together. Right from the start of Luke's Gospel, where John's father speaks words over his tiny newborn son and says, In you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. He spoke those over his tiny eight-day-old baby. Through to John fulfilling those words as a grown man, as he came and was the voice in the desert, the Bible tells us, saying, prepare the way for the Lord. And his reminder to the crowds that gathered around him that he was not the Messiah, but someone greater was coming. And he says, I baptise with water, but one more powerful than I will come, whose thongs of his, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then when Jesus began his ministry, he began it with his baptism by John. 
He began it by going down into the River Jordan, being baptised by John, and at that point the heavens opened. The Holy Spirit came on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then to John's death, a couple of years before this story, through to this story now, the ministry of these two was intrinsically tied together. When Jesus answers their question about his authority with his own question about John's authority, they knew they couldn't answer. Because if they said John's authority comes from heaven, then it was an absolutely natural extension from that, that Jesus's authority comes from heaven. And if they deny John's authority and say he was only doing things off his own back, then even now his following was so great, two to three years after his death, that the crowds would likely turn on them. And so, after some muttering and frantic whispering between them, these leaders could only say, we don't know. They weren't willing to lay it on the line and say what they really thought. And so Jesus says, well, in which case I won't tell you where my authority comes from either. But yet, he then does go on to tell them where his authority comes from with the parable that he next tells. And this is no elusive parable with hidden meanings. There is no doubt in the minds of the people that were listening to him 2,000 years ago what he was saying in this story. Throughout the Hebrew scriptures, which largely form what we call the Old Testament, the people of God, Israel, were described as a vineyard. Isaiah talks of God's people being a vineyard that he has lovingly planted and tended and prepared the ground for and nurtures. And in case there was any doubt at all what Isaiah might be saying in that passage, he ends it with the description, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Psalm 80 says, you have bought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it and prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root and it filled the land. Look down from heaven and see and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand has planted and the branch that you made strong for yourself. Hosea, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all of the prophets of the Old Testament spoke of Israel as the vine and the vineyard of God tended, cared for. Often those prophets were chastising that vine for not bearing the fruit that it should, for not doing all that God, the vine tender, wanted them to do. But always that vineyard was brought back to God and back to fruitfulness. And when we believe in Jesus, here today, 2,000 years later, we come to God ourselves through him. And the New Testament makes it clear that we are not some new fangled vine that God um, plants in place of Israel. We don't start a new vineyard and call it Jesus' vineyard. We are grafted into that original vine. And I looked up a definition of grafting because I, I kind of know what it means, but I couldn't describe it, so I looked it up. I wanted to explain it in case anyone else goes, what on earth do you mean grafting into a vine? And I found this on a gardening site, which I thought was absolutely beautiful. Grafting is a technique that joins two plants into one. In general, a wound is created in one of the plants and the other is inserted into that wound so each plant's tissues can grow together. Because in Jesus and his death on the cross, us who are not naturally part of Israel, part of the Jewish nation, are grafted into that. And when we turn to God, we are enabled to grow together with the ancient people of God. We are accepted into the vine that God has already been tending, that God has planned for since the world began, that God has blessed in order that it will be a blessing to the world. But in short, when Jesus starts talking about a vineyard, everyone listening will have known that he was talking about Israel, about the Jewish nation. They will know that the man who planted the vineyard is a picture of God. 
The vineyard is God's people, Israel, and God has sent his servants to those people, prophets, messengers, calling them back to him. But they failed to listen and mistreated the prophets. And so in despair, he cries out, what shall I do? How will I show these people how much I love them and want them to come back to me? Rightly, he could at this point unleash his anger, but no, he searches for a solution. And he decides to send his beloved son whom he loves in the hope that those who tend the vineyard, which were the religious leaders and they knew that he was talking about them, will respect him. Remember what was said over Jesus at his baptism. This is my beloved son. There were no mixed messages or hidden meanings here. Everyone knew what Jesus was saying. And Jesus, as he stands there, knows that he is on the final part of his journey and very soon he will be rejected and killed like the beloved son in the parable. And so the people that care for God's people we hear today will, learn, will be held accountable for not fixing their eye on the sun and seeing in him the love of God. Religious leaders of our day need to listen up are we seeing the sun, realising his importance and remembering that those that we care for are his and we need to be continually pointing to him? But what does all of this mean for us here today? It means that we now, God's people here and now, in the middle of wherever we are, sitting in our homes, doing whatever, need to make sure that Jesus is the most important thing. He refers to himself as the cornerstone. We need to recognise that Jesus is not just a messenger from God, but we recognise him as his beloved son. We will soon be entering Advent and moving towards Christmas, and we remember that that son came in vulnerability and poverty as a baby. In the darkness of a night, God appeared tiny and naked. Before Advent starts on the 29th of November, which is the first Sunday of Advent, we will be sending out another worship at home booklet, along with probably a letter letting you know what we're hoping to do for Christmas and Advent. And I'd encourage you to use that through Advent in any way that is helpful to you. It's not going to be set down, do this on this day, this on that day, but it will be prayers, reflections that you just might want to spend some time praying, reading, thinking about over Advent. Use it to focus your eyes on Jesus. If you're not on our mailing list and you want to get that, please do contact us um, and we can send that to you. But these are hard times. And I am the absolute first to advocate self-care in these times. Be kind to yourself. Reach out to others when you're struggling. Get some fresh air every day. Exercise. Plan your day so there are little bits in it that bring you joy and give you life. But all of those are building blocks that need to be built on a strong foundation. And if we reject the most important building block, the cornerstone, which is Jesus, then everything else becomes unstable. Because Jesus is the only thing that remains stable. Whatever is going on around us. We're living through a time when plans cannot be made. And if you make them, you have to be prepared that they will change at the last minute. Just as I was preparing this um, talk my daughter was home from school because her school had been shut because of some cases, but there was no cases in her year, so that was fine. Um, she was doing her work at home, but could otherwise carry on as normal. I was planning, once she got her work done and I'd prepared my sermon, to take her out for a walk in the sunshine. Whilst preparing the sermon, I got a message to say there was a case now in her year and she had to self-isolate. Even the simplest of plans change at the last minute at the moment. And that's something I personally struggle with. I like to know what is happening. And the uncertainty of this time is one, something that I find really hard. But in the middle of that, what I have had to do is continue to keep my focus on Jesus. 
We don't know what Christmas might look like, and that is causing anxiety for people. How big a turkey should we buy? Is anyone going to be able to come round? What might it look like as a celebration? What we do know, though, is that nothing can change the fact that 2,000 years ago, God stepped into history. He loved us so much that he lived his life showing us what it means to be truly vulnerable, truly self-giving, and truly inclusive. And he died for us on the cross, and he rose again and ascended into heaven, and in ascending into heaven took our humanity to sit at God's right hand. We have to keep our focus on that. You take that cornerstone away, that yellow stone in the side of the picture, and even the most beautiful and impressive house that you build, even the most perfect looking life from the outside, becomes unstable and will likely fall down. And that is not to say, believe in Jesus and everything will be fine, but rather to say that in the midst of a life that might not be fine, Jesus remains. What shall I do, God says, to show these people how much I love them? I will send my beloved son. And he remains faithful. And so my prayer is that we will focus on that son and build our life on him. Even in the midst of uncertainty and storms and pandemics and global political turmoil and families that might drive us mad but are there all the time anyway, or families that we long to see but can't at the moment, in the midst of uncertainty over what the future might bring. We keep our focus on Jesus because God became flesh and dwelt among us. And so in the midst of all of the range of emotions that we feel at this time, and it may be that you are feeling grief for people, for things that you can't do, for plans that you had, for loved ones. It may be that you feel fear as you look to the future or even to today. It may be that sadness is sometimes overwhelming. It may be that actually you're feeling peace in this time and joy and comfort. But whatever we are feeling, our lives are not built on those feelings. We stand firmly on the cornerstone of Jesus, even if sometimes we shake as we stand there. And so, brothers, an old hymn went through my mind as I was preparing this, and it's gone through my mind over and over again. Fix your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Oh, Queen.
For many of us at the moment, our world feels confusing and painful. We pray for those who are stretched beyond their own capacity to cope. Keep us close to you, God, when we feel overwhelmed. Help us to remember that you are strong when we are weak. We ask that your power will come alive in us and drive away our fear. Loving God, give us strength and peace. We pray for our country and our world. We ask that you give wisdom to those in authority at this difficult time. Be present in the places of the world where there is famine and disaster. Give power to the cries of the voiceless in societies where protest is punished and there is no freedom of speech. We thank you for the liberty that we are able to enjoy in our own country, that we're able to worship you openly. Loving God, give us strength and peace. We lift our family and friends to you. Even if we can't physically be with them, we pray that we would still feel connected. Help us to remember that we are bound by ties of love that cannot be broken. Let's take a moment to think about the loved ones who are on our hearts at the moment. We hold the vulnerable and isolated in our thoughts of prayer and prayers at this time of a pandemic. Give comfort to all those who are in hospital and who may be alone and afraid. Fill the hands of those who care for them with gentleness and skill. Loving God, give us strength and peace. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing work of key workers. And we pray for protection over everyone who is working so hard to keep our lives as normal and to keep services functioning. Today we remember especially all schools and colleges, especially those in our local community, for staff, students and worried parents and carers. There's so much uncertainty at the moment and we pray that schools will be places of safety and laughter, not of concern and tension. Bless our whole church family. We pray for Richard, Laura, Lynn, Sharon, their families. We thank you for the work of the church wardens and the PCC. Please guide the preparation for Christmas and their decision making and give them resilience for the days ahead. Loving God, give us strength and peace. Loss is all around us at the moment. We pray for those who are bereaved, who are feeling pain and grief. Lord Jesus, when they feel alone, we pray that they will know that you are their constant companion and that you understand all the emotions that they are feeling. We remember those who as a church, who we as a church have lost this year 
and at this time we pray especially for Morris, for June and the family. We remember in our hearts all those who have gone to be with you. Loving God, give us strength and peace. At this time, help us to remember that Christ is our cornerstone. We can depend on him and trust him. All our hopes rest on him and he will never fail us. Amen. And so as our time here together draws to an end, my prayer is that you will know the steadfastness of God this week. That you will know his peace surrounding you in the toughest moments and his joy bubbling up inside of you at moments too. And so a blessing as we go. May the blessing of our Lord God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you, remain with you and all those that you love now and always. Amen. You are the word of the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is. Didn't